everyone. Welcome back to the latest lecture session. As is the norm, a quick recap of what we have been up to. In the last couple of sessions, we have been looking at or we have been discussing uh, settling, different types of settling in the context of primary uh, treatment, right? Why were we trying to settle particles and such? Because we have these bigger particles which can be removed with the assistance of uh, gravity so that we decrease the load on the biological process where we need to provide oxygen and which thus requires uh, money or resources, let us say, right? So, in that context, we looked at different types of settling, type 1, discrete, discrete, right? Each one does not, each particle does not interfere with the other. In this context, obviously, we looked at uh, what do we say uh, gravity so we looked at uh, three forces gravity pulling it down buoyancy yes due to the relevant fluid there and then the friction or the drag force let's see when all these three uh, what do we say negate each other right uh, we have the terminal the particle reaching its terminal velocity or the settling velocity right and we looked at how you know uh, we are you know people came up with the stokes law and uh, that was applicable when Reynolds number was less than 1 or is even is applicable when it is less than 100, but it is applicable in laminar flow and when we have spheres, let us say, right, and, we, and when we are discussing spheres. And in that context, we moved on, uh, I mean, we discussed some aspects and then we moved on to looking at type 2 settling wherein, you know, due to difference in velocities and the fluid or you know a bigger particle and a smaller particle having different velocities of settling and then coming together right we were looking at flocks being formed and then flocculation or flocculent settling which was type 2 and then we looked at how to what do we say understand the system and try to design it and we looked at what do we say some data and looked at one example in that context let us clear up some aspects or discuss them so here we have discrete settling of uh, particles right uh, where let us say gravity minus buoyancy is equal to the drag force right. So, the particle has reached its terminal settling velocity. So, what do we see now you know if uh, this is the settling column right and we see that with uh, depth it uh, decreases obviously this line is going to be a straight line because now the velocity is constant and it is discrete settling now. Right, that is something that is not a no brainer. Obviously, here we are considering that all the particles are more or less of, are of the same size, let us say, right. So, that is why we have entirely clear liquid at the top and particles being concentrated at the bottom out here, yes. And what do we have here? So, general inferences which we discussed earlier, but I want to discuss one aspect which we will look at later, let us say, right. This is the aspect. So, if I want to ca calculate the concentration in the mixture, which we are referring to as mixed, calculate the concentration of the relevant uh, suspended solids in the mixture. So, I need to understand that there are two zones, right? Yes. So, I need to look at weighted average as in for this zone, I need to average it or weighted by the concentration of the TSS in this zone and for this zone, Right, I need to weight it by the concentration of the TSS in this zone. Whatever has settled down right at the bottom, we are assuming that that is not uh, present, let us say. So, for this particular zone, let us say, what do we have? We know, let us say, or we assume that the concentration is C naught, let us say, okay, uh, which is the, I guess, more or less the initial concentration, okay. So, what do we have? C naught into Z minus H, right? Z is this and we are subtracting h, right. So, we are looking at z minus h by z, right, into C naught. That gives us uh, the concentration in this particular layer and we are looking at weightage obviously. And in the above layer, h by z, let us say, there is no, what do we say, it suspended solids, that is why we have 0. So, C mixture, it is equal to C naught into z minus h by z, let us say, right. The concentration is uniform here, that is what we always have. So, let us move on, uh, we will look at this uh, later again, but please keep this in mind as in we are weighting it by the concentration in that zone, right, or we are considering the concentration in that zone and also uh, weightages, right, we are looking at the height of that particular uh, zone, let us say, right, that is something to keep in mind. Unlike the previous case, if we have different particles with different 
terminal velocities. So here we have an example. Again, this is from Professor Markham Benjamin, right, who wrote the book Water Chemistry. He is pretty famous for that. So we have different particles with different uh, sizes and thus let us say terminal velocities, let us say, right, settling velocities, different settling velocities. And the concentration of these settling velocity, I mean the compounds with these settling velocities is given out here. And then we have, let us say, data of, uh, you know, how much distance they have fallen after different times, right. So, obviously, if a particular particle has a greater settling velocity that is going to travel a greater distance. If it has a lesser, uh, what do we say, uh, settling velocity, it is going to travel a lesser distance. Again, here we are still assuming that it is discrete, uh, what do we say, settling. So, if this is the initial picture, right, and these thickness more or less indicate the concentration, if I am not wrong, right. So, after 10 minutes, the one with the relatively, what do we say, slow settling velocity or less settling velocity only settles a bit and the one with uh, the greatest or highest settling velocity settles a lot and I guess here we are talking about uh, what we say are 50 centimeters. So, that was already reached for this particular particle and so progressively the other particles too keep settling down. So, this is more realistic because in wastewater you do not have particles of just one size, but particles of different sizes. Obviously, here we are assuming uh, different uh, what do we say or having some assumptions, but uh, we are not going to go into that now, let us see. So, what is the profile looking like right now? It is uh, the total concentration at any depth is the sum of the concentration of the particles at, the, the, at that depth, pardon me. So, uh, again, what is the profile looking like, right? You see this profile, yes. So, these are the assumptions or these are some of the inferences out here. But again, we are not uh, going to look at that in detail. But if you look at these, uh, what do we say, inferences or such, we see that, you know, it is typically not uh, practical or, you know, it does not really uh, happen in that way. So, a more realistic one would be, you know, when suspensions contain particles of virtually all velocities. So, that rather than this step kind of distribution, we see this step kind of distribution, we have a continuous, what do we say? distribution like this, let us see, right. So, that is one aspect, fine. But again, all these aspects we were discussing were about type 1, discrete. But we know that, you know, that is again rarely the case. Mostly, we come across type 2. You know, here we have a good figure, effect of particle agglomeration or let us say flocculation on settling. So, particle A, this is the profile. Particle B, this is the profile. But because they came together due to, let us say, either differential or different settling velocities or due to different fluid velocities there, they came together. And now you see that the flock settles uh, faster, let us say, right. Again, type 2 settling where we have flock plant settling. So, this is what we usually encounter. And we looked at one example, but let us just look at uh, it in some detail, let us say, right. I believe I rushed it the last time. So, I want to discuss this in detail. So, we got data, we plot the percentages and then from those percentage removals, we can get the, what is it now, what are they calling that isoplets, I guess, which are more or less uh, nothing but constant removals, let us see. So, this can be for 30, okay, for 40 percent, 50 percent, 60, 70, 80. This you will get based on interpolating the data, which you measure at different depths, you know, this is the actual data and you are uh, interpolating, right. So, how does this help me, let us see. So, let us say I am going to choose a particular uh, time and depth. So, at this particular depth, I can, I know the time here, right, that is how we have, this is x axis time. So, at this particular depth, what is it that we know here, okay. So, removal at the bottom of the column, here it is 42, I guess maybe I am looking at this, is it, okay. And it is 100 percent at the top, let us see. So, maybe this has to be corrected, it is not uh, 42, let us see, right. So, that is what we have, but I know that it is 50 or you know or the relevant uh, point of intersection here at the bottom and let us say 100 percent about the, at the top. But here you see that there are still particles with varying, what do we say, levels of removal or at different depths we have different uh, levels of removal, let us say. So, how do I get the total concentration here? So, similar to what we did in discrete settling, we are going to look at giving the weights as in in terms of depth, 
we know the depth and here the average removal will be 60 plus 50 by 2, 55 percent and here this is what we have and for this zone or height we will say it is 70 plus 60 by 2. So, that is what we have you know uh, 55 percent, 65, 75, 90 percent corresponding to this height let us say in the relevant column or the sedimentation tank right. And from that we got that relevant uh, removal if you remember the total removal was nothing but removal at this point right or total removal at this point plus uh, what now this particular uh, what do we say height where we look at the midpoint I guess and then we looked at the average of uh, these two particular values 60 plus 50 by what is it now 60 plus 50 by 2 and then into this h if I say or delta z4 by the total here total depth let us say is h let us say. So, in this way we looked at it earlier. So, you know same case I guess you can uh, what do we say analyze it for any system right and uh, we also looked at effect of depth and we know that let us say ok let us understand this figure. We calculated the overflow velocity such that the particle if it just comes out at the top and has this uh, settling velocity equal to this overflow velocity it will just be removed let us say right. So, this uh, settling velocity is obviously in the downward direction, but the water is taking it in this direction. So, the net will be in this direction and that is what we have out here. So, this velocity is due to the relevant uh, fluid flow, this is due to the settling of the particle. So, if a particle has uh, settling velocity equal to V naught, it will just be removed that is what if we see. But if the particle coming in at the same location has a settling velocity less than V naught, obviously it is not going to be removed that is what you see out here right. So, that is some, something we already discussed. And then we looked at the depth. For example, if I decrease the depth right what is going to happen here? The overflow velocity if you remember is uh, how did we calculate that? I think we calculate that by looking at Q by the top uh, what do we say area let us say right? or surface area pardon me right. And here we have q by length into width and we do not have uh, height out here right. So, mathematically we can see that height does not affect your overflow rate and thus uh, your removal efficiency. Let us just try to understand it here if I decrease the height and the flow rate is still the same. So, this velocity of the fluid will now be twice you can look at the relevant algebra that is pretty simple right and uh, you know now the height is uh, lesser let us say right. And again you will see that it is still the same though right V naught and still V. So, the lesser height lesser time available let us say right. So, that is what uh, you will uh, have. So, even though we have less height you will now have lesser time for the particle to spend in this reactor and settle down. Again the whole point comes down to whether the settling velocity is greater than or less than uh, what is this V naught. If it was twice though instead of h it was 2 h it might seem like there is more uh, time though right that is true. But then the particle also has to uh, what do we say settle down for twice the distance let us say right or twice the height. So, both ways you see that height does not affect your uh, removal efficiency. Only way is to increase that uh, surface area which can be done by putting in a tray here right. So, in effect you are decreasing the surface uh, what do we say or increasing the surface area and thus in effect decreasing the uh, V naught or effective V naught here let us say V naught effective will be the previous V naught by 2 because here I am providing a tray here. So, now obviously you will have increased removal efficiency for the same volume, but obviously here the case is that we have an intermediate tray. So, these were the aspects that we uh, looked at. So, let us look at some of the other aspects ok. So, here we have what do we say on the y axis the particle concentration and here different types of uh, settling were mentioned discrete settling when the particles do not influence or interact with the other particles and then type 2 or flock length settling when you know obviously you know particles interact and form flocks let us see. The next one will be hindered or zone settling I guess we have better figures here, but let us just try to briefly look at it. So, what happens is after certain what do we say level of settling and actuality what do you see? You see particles coming together right and now water is I would not say trapped, but it has to or it does not have a clear path to go around. 
For example, earlier water could go around like this or this now, but now you have something like this and water finds it difficult to go out. Only in these interstices between the particles, the water will go out. And also because the particles are so close to each other, they also uh, repel them, repel each other, right? And in effect, you will have what we say decreased uh, settling velocities beneath these particles, right? So that's hindered or zone. Why do we say zone? Because more or less you see that all these particles are entrapped out here. And as these particles settle down, you know, you clearly see a zone uh, above and below. Above relatively clear, below, you know, where you have the suspended uh, matter. So, that is what you see out here. And compression settling. Here it is not as if particles settle down, but let us say because of, if I may use this uh, layman's term, the weight of the, what do we say, overlying uh, particles, the water in these pores will be squeezed out, right? So, then you see more or less uh, compaction or particles compacting and that we are calling as compression settling, let us say, right? So, water displaced from the pores as particles settle and compress the layers beneath it. So, discrete, flock length, hindered settling and compression settling. Let us look at some uh, figures. So, rectangular tank, if narrow rectangular tanks anyway as you can see here this is the plan top view and this is the uh, side view let us say right again narrow rectangular plants uh, not plants uh, sedimentation tanks are typically much better with respect to removal efficiency let us say right but the issue here is that if you have long narrow what do we say tanks the area beside it you cannot really use it right so it is typically uneconomical for the plant or with respect to the construction efficiency let us say even though the removal efficiency might be high. So, that is one thing to uh, keep in mind. I believe we have figures for this, for these chains and such. We will look at that. Okay, let us just look at it. So, influent out here. So, sludge hoppers, that is fine. I guess you see the sludge hoppers from here too. We will not look at that. So, again the water is flowing in this direction and particles that are settled out will be removed by the scraper board. So, you will have, okay, I have a better figure later. We will look at that. So, that will scrape the sludge and bring that out here. Let us say, okay, you have this, you can see that from the side view. So, what is going to happen? These chains moving in this direction, they will scrape the sludge at the bottom, bring it down here, right? So, that is what you see. And maintaining these kinds of uh, scrapers is always an issue. So, people typically, what do we say, go for this uh, rotating or circular types of uh, scrapers, let us say. Please note that here we still have a rectangular, uh, what do we say, sedimentation basin. What is happening here? We have water coming in. We have baffles out here, right, to distribute the flow, bring down the velocity, right. And then you have, what do we say, a rectangular, what do we say, uh, sedimentation tank, right. But here we do not have scrapers like the earlier case, but we have, what do we say, a circular scraper, if I may say so, right. Flock later and square sedimentation tank for water clarification. And uh, one issue here is that obviously you see you have dead zones out here. So, removal of the sludge or particles that have settled out here is an issue. And looks like due to the wear length along this particular edges and such, you can have radial flow or non-uniform flow affecting your removal efficiency. So, that is one aspect to uh, consider. Again, side view as you can see, water coming in, you have baffles here again mixing to provide flocculation and then it comes in, right? And then it settles down as it goes through and you here you have these, uh, what is it, rake arms, circular rake arms that get the job done with respect to scraping the sludge. But the most widely used ones are going to be the uh, circular sedimentation tanks where the water comes in from the bottom and here you have flocculation, right? And then it flows uh, radially. With respect to efficient usage of area within the tank for sedimentation, this is not as good a design as the relevant rectangular tanks or such. But why is it that people go for it? Because they are cheap, maintenance is easier, right? And even, I mean, when I say cheap, the capital costs are pretty less, maintenance is always better. So, that is why people typically go a lot for these particular, uh, these kinds of circular sedimentation tanks, right? So, that is something to keep in mind. Let us move forth. So, when we are designing, you know, primary sedimentation tanks, obviously, we need to look at some variables, but the primary variables are obviously the volume of your tank. But that 
obviously needs to take into account the average flow and also the peak flow. And one reason why we have let us say sedimentation tanks of depth 3 meters or so even though theoretically the depth can be much lesser is that let us say I design it for average flow and have a depth of let us say 30 centimeters or so let us see okay. And then you have the peak flow coming here and then everything is going to scoured up and you are going to have what we say turbulence in the system and everything being scoured up. So obviously you want to prefer or see to it that you can tackle these uh, peak flows right and you want to avoid turbulence in your primary sedimentation tank and also you want to promote flock formation right. So you always obviously want to or uh, that is the reason why people go for sedimentation tank depths of around 3 meters or so even though you know uh, the design for from point of view of just sedimentation let us see or the Stokes velocity will tell you otherwise let us see. And what else I also need to look at the depth as I mentioned typically 3 meters and once I can uh, get the volume and depending on the flow rate I will have the detention time or hydraulic retention time let us see. So we have different ranges around 2 hours at average flow and what is that uh, peak flow and at design flow but again you do not need to mug these up and where overflow rate right or overflow rate is something that we need to be looking at. So these are the primary design variables and what else do I need to look at as an I need to look at whether I want to go for circular or rectangular right. Why we already discussed it easier to remove solids at the bottom less maintenance cost and more importantly the construction costs are pretty less the capital costs are pretty less. But rectangular obviously more effective use of area and here we see typically that the length to width right or length is typically more let us say right. Because let us say think of this if you have this assume that this area or top view this is the top view and this. So here you can have a lot of short circuiting occur right. For example you want the particle to settle down right but here you can have short circuiting occurring as in not every particle that comes in at the influent or you know you are not going to design it so well that you are going to have very good distribution and such let us say right. And obviously here energy dissipation depending on the design pretty good and you have longer what do we say paths for the uh, what is it settling of the relevant particle right. But here obviously people can use the side area more effectively that is why people prefer rectangular to long narrow rectangles or these kinds of rectangular sedimentation tanks to long narrow sedimentation tanks. But from the point of view of maintenance and cost people go for circular sedimentation tanks right. Inlet design again a part of secondary design values what are we concerned with we as I mentioned we want to decrease the energy or dissipate the inlet energy right and you want to prevent uh, cross uh, circuiting and you want to distribute the flow and flow balancing among tanks and also baffling which is more or less a part of what we uh, just discussed earlier let us see. Weir design right again you want to have uh, as quiescent flow conditions or laminar flow conditions as possible and then you are going to have it but we are not going to go into design here but you can look at the relevant uh, what do we say loadings here. So let us just look at one example out here. A primary sedimentation basin is designed to treat a wastewater that has an annual average flow Q average is 300 meter cube per hour and maximum 2 hour flow Q peak we will looked at this 2 hour flow meaning for uh, let us say over this year the maximum flow which continuously which was observed continuously over a 2 hour period was 550 meter cube per hour. Use these to determine the required diameter and depth meaning a circular sedimentation basin. Assume that it is a conical bottom so that no additional depth is required for sludge storage as in typically let us say you know you are going to have some freeboard we are did not discuss this or we did not mention this freeboard because you are not going to plan it such that the water is up to the brim and then you are going to have your effective uh, zone and then your sludge zone let us say right. So you will have to take into account all these heights but here we are only looking at this particular height out here. So how do we uh, go about it what do we have we have the surface overflow rate V0 and we have the hydraulic retention time theta is equal to volume by uh, what is this Q V by Q let us say right. So how do we get this or what does this tell me this tells me the 
time that this particular water or the particle will spend in this reactor, hydraulic retention time for how long is the particle being retained in the relevant reactor. So, again it is pretty straightforward. let us uh, go through this. We know we have our surface overflow uh, rate, but again there are two what do we say overflow rates given, right. So, we will have to look at it from uh, both points of view. So, we will calculate the uh, what do we say case when we look at the average values. So, 300 meter cube per hour average flow by what do we say the relevant overflow rate at the average uh, flow. So, we get 200 meter square. Similarly, for the peak we will calculate that and we get 183 meter square. So, okay, so it seems fine in that context, but we will end up uh, choosing the higher uh, value, right? Because the one that we are going to choose needs to meet the design from both the average and peak, uh, what do we say, flows. And thus, we are going to look at uh, what is it now? The higher or take the higher, what do we say, area here, right? This is the plan area that is something to uh, note here, right? Always the plan area, at least with respect to the uh, overflow rate. And then uh, what next? Okay, we have the area and then the diameter and depth. Well, that is again a pretty easy aspect. So, we know that area is equal to pi d square by 4. So, from that I can get the relevant uh, diameter. Let us see here we are done with diameter and the next aspect is depth. So, depth obviously we have other uh, values here as in we have the hydraulic retention time. So, this will give us an idea about how much time the water molecule will spend in the system. So, theta equal to v by q. So, we have uh, v equal to theta q obviously and average volume or volume required based on average flow conditions. Let us say I get 450 meter cube based on peak flow conditions I get 550 meter cube, right. So, from that I am going to obviously choose the larger volume of the relevant tank, right because you cannot have overflow or you do not want to have overflow of your particular tank. So, I choose the bigger higher uh, value and I am trying to calculate the diameter. I have the volume, I have the area somewhere, right? I have the area and now I can calculate the height, let us see. So, I am now able to calculate both the uh, what is it diameter and the relevant height of my particular sedimentation tank, right? So, that is a general aspect, it is just algebra out here. So, let us just look at uh, what we say typical values, retention time, theta or TR, some people look at TR, some people say TD, but theta is a better one because of obvious reasons. Okay, for water treatment, right, retention time is 2 to 4 hours, okay, and overflow rate is a typical uh, overflow rate, right, is uh, around this particular, around this particular value. Again, overflow rate, we know that it is going to be equal to Q by cross sectional area. So, that is why you have the units meter cube per day for the flow rate, volume of water per time by the cross sectional area, not cross sectional area I guess, pardon me, surface area that is meter square. So, that is what you see and here in wastewater treatment we have different what do we say sedimentation tanks. For grid chamber when we are where we are trying to remove only the bigger and inert particles, obviously retention time is less and surface overflow rate is higher let us say, right. So, obviously particles with uh, what do we say lower settling velocities will not be able to settle down to the bottom. Primary clarifiers, we increase the time, retention time and uh, look at uh, the concurrent decrease in the overflow rate, let us say, right. And secondary clarifiers where we which are going to come into the picture after the biological process where we remove the organic content and you have flock forming bacteria which settle down to the bottom, right. Obviously, time is higher, again the particles are much lesser and the overflow rate also is pretty less, right. So, just an idea here, let us see. And uh, let us le just look at the, some pictures and wrap up this particular session. So, here we have, you know, long, what do we say, narrow rectangular uh, basins, if I may say so. But okay, uh, it is not that narrow, right. Ideally, let us say if I have something like this and each one was an individual, what do we say, tank, that would have been better. But here, as you can see, this is the inlet, inlet two tanks in parallel and then you have the effluent wear all out here, right, effluent all along here, right. But here they did not have just one chain because as is mentioned out here, you know the sludge is pretty heavy. So, they have only uh, not only more chains let us say, right and drive gears and motors and such let us say, yes. 
So, again baffle walls right again not a great design here right head end of sedimentation basin showing the baffle boards and then you can see these uh, what is that uh, scrapes or such you see the chain. So, it is going to rotate in this direction come down right and scrape it like this or depending on where they have their uh, collection it can be the other way too right. So, that is one aspect ok. So, scraping sludge is going in this this is the bottom one is uh, going out there and this one towards here let us see. So, this obviously ok. So, it was going in this direction let us see it is going out like this and then rotating up and then again coming back. So, that is what we see out here right. So, there are other kinds of uh, what do we say uh, settling basins, but where I guess the design is of crucial aspect. We know that you know you do not really require a lot of depth if you design it let us right, but typically to provide for flock formation and more or less to have your uh, what do we say sludge settle down well you sometimes provide depth as high as 3 meters, but theoretically if you look at sedimentation you do not need to do that let us see. So, the way to do it as in provide more surface area right. So, more surface area and bring down the V naught is by providing these uh, plate settlers or tube settlers. So, this is one particular uh, picture here two plate settler modules right one and two. So, let us just see how it works. So, water with flock enters here and you have these plates right you have this plates out here and you know you have this flock settling down here and then coming down. So, this is counter current and then the sludge leaves at the bottom let us see right. So, these are all the uh, settling plates I looked I believe we looked at uh, picture earlier and then the water comes out I um, mean the settled water or the water clear of the suspended water uh, particles will come out at this top at this part and I think ok. So, when it is installed this is how it will look like right plate settlers from the top view they are installed and now you see that again details of the water discharge system from the plate settlers. It moves up from the plate settlers over the pipes and down through the control orifices I guess ok. And here you see pretty clear uh, water ok. So, water comes in uh, comes up through the plates goes through these particular circular orifices and then is discharged into the launders let us say right. So, that is uh, one particular you can see the clear uh, what do we see water coming up from the tube settler out here. So, tube plate settlers you are more or less what do we say increasing the surface area and also making the process more efficient because you have compact systems now right. And obviously, where's we will not go into that again uh, primary design uh, variables we looked at that. So, I am going to skip this for now ok. So, uh, in India again people are still learning and we are still turning to what do we say improve ourselves. So, this is the typical what do we say uh, old fashioned uh, wares not uh, not wares uh, sedimentation tank and the wares out here wares right again not a great design looking at uh, what we have, but I do not know the situation on the uh, ground there right. So, that is what we have and then water overflowing out here right. So, that is something to consider and then uh, what do we say uh, sedimentation tanks what is it that we are trying to do we are primarily trying to remove the suspended particles, but along with suspended particles some organic content which is suspended or adsorbed onto these suspended particles will also be removed. And again will we have removal of all the suspended particles not really. So, we have typically what do we say fraction being uh, removed let us say right. And again Indian uh, aspects the issue is that people do not maintain it and run the systems well design is always uh, also not great, but again that is what we are trying to change by I guess uh, learning here right. So, primary aspects or other aspect to consider is that BOD will also be removed, but you will typically not absorb more than 35 BOD removal. And as mentioned earlier we are primarily concerned with overflow rate and then the hydraulic retention time or the detention time and the height of the relevant uh, sedimentation base it, let us see right. And then hindered zone let us uh, wrap it up particles settle as a zone or blanket right that is something that we already look at. And uh, one aspect here is that uh, now the settling velocities are going to be relatively less. Uh, and again uh, water has to find its uh, way out from under these or through these particles through the interstices between the relevant uh, particles let us say right. Because you have a zone you are going to have a clear interface between the sludge and the above effluent that is something to keep in mind. So, hindered settling uh, we already looked at this. So, I will move on from here and compression settling ok we have a good uh, picture out here. 
So here the water is squeezed out of the sludge as I mentioned, right? It is not really particles settling down, but the weight see, of the particles above seeing to it that the water is squeezed out from the particles underneath, right? So that is why we call it as compression settling, let us say, right? So here we see, let us say first right now it is hindered settling and then our zone, uh, what we say settling, we see clear water and then the hindered settling out here. But now already the sludge out here is experiencing compression settling and the transition zone in between and then all the hindered settling is done. We just have the transition and the compression settling, let us say, right? And then we end up out here, let us say, right? So uh, that is uh, pretty much obvious, right? And again, as you can see, the weight and then all the water trapped out here is being compressed and released, let us say, right? So I am almost uh, done with my time. And we are also done with uh, looking at primary sedimentation. So, what next? I removed the suspended particles and some dissolved organic content and uh, most of the suspended organic content. Next, I want to remove the soluble organic content, let us say, or the dissolved organic content. And that I am going to do by the aid of microbes, right? So, with that, I will end my uh, session and we will take continue this in the next session. Thank you.